praise and honor.
sing it with grateful hearts this morning.
love you this morning. And it's with grateful hearts that we acknowledge that the blessing of the Lord makes rich and adds no sorrow with it. Lord, we lift every need in this room and beyond these walls to you, every burden, every care, every sickness, every concern, every decision, every dilemma. We lift it all to you today and ask that you will touch and move as only you can. Touch those today that are at home, sick, some are in the hospital, others today are bereaved, and we pray that you'll bring them comfort for your glory and for your honor. Continue your outpoured blessings upon this service this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Turn around and wave at somebody before you're seated. Let them know you're glad they're in church with you. God bless you. We are delighted to have guests with us in this service. We had the folks in the early service as well. In fact, if we had the early crowd in here with you now, we'd just about be packed. And uh, so we're grateful for your faithfulness. Those of you who are guests, welcome to Maranatha Family Church. We hope this will just be the first of many times that you will be here with us. We welcome back folks this morning, some of whom have been out quite a while with sickness, and they've made it back in today. We're so glad to see you. Those of you that are joining this service by way of the Internet, we welcome you as well. We invite you to come worship with us whenever you are in our area. I want to make mention of an announcement, and that is that um, Christina Thompson, who's sitting right in front of me here, her mom passed away, and uh, her celebration of life will be held on Tuesday of this week at 2.30 at the Deal Funeral Home in Statesboro. And everyone is welcome to attend. And Christina, we're praying for you, darling. And know that the Lord's going to strengthen you and help you. Our ushers are coming now to receive our Sunday morning tithe, missions, and offerings. God bless you as you give. Father, thank you because you love a cheerful giver. And may we give cheerfully because we have been blessed and enabled to give. Thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Family Church is excited to announce the rollout of our new Church Center app. Available on iOS and Android devices, our app will connect you to Maranatha with the touch of your finger. Church Center also makes giving really easy. Just enter the amount you want to give, click next, and you're on your way. Missed a service? That's okay. Just click worship services and you can watch it on YouTube. Want some help downloading it? Our Geek Squad will be in the coffee shop after service. Look for them wearing black t-shirts. Connect with Maranatha through the Church Center app today. What was 
Don't you love our worship team? Man, they rock the house. Well, it's good to have the first lady back in uh, service with us. Oh, slacker. She didn't like being home, I can tell you that. She especially didn't like when our oldest son and his wife showed up and wanted to go down to some island down somewhere for a few days, and she couldn't go. Mm, mm, mm. Thought there was going to be a funeral at our house. <laughs> hey, uh, part of our Maranatha family moved away, and thank God they found their way back home. Ronnie and Ann Flowers, we're certainly glad to have them today. We've had a tremendous day. I met a couple this morning that... Uh, Cotton saw them and invited them, and they were looking for a church, and they came. Hey, folks, that's the way you do that. I just want you to know. That's the way you get people in church. So we had a great, great morning, and we enjoyed it so much. Hope you have and hope you will continue to do so. Um, we're just proud that we're kind of crawling back to where we, almost to where we was. So, uh, we haven't got everybody back yet. Y'all got too used to being off, I can tell you. That ain't good. That ain't good. We're glad you're back today. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of Acts. We're going to be looking in chapter 13. It's a great chapter that has a great lesson for us. And so, I'm not going to read like all the verses at one time. We're going to talk about them a little alone. We're the people of God, and there's a reason for that. You know, I've learned a lot in life that people usually, and for the most part, like people. Now, there are some people that don't. My wife says that, that I'm crazy, that I'll talk to anybody, and, and I probably will. We were standing in a restaurant one time, and the 
place was packed, and so seating was hard to get. This was back even before the COVID separation. And uh, we're standing there, and there was a couple behind us, and and uh, they were waiting, had been waiting a long time, and I struck up a conversation with them, and I said, well, hey, why don't y'all just join us at our table? My wife looked at me like, I'm going to kill you when we get home. <laughs> she doesn't meet people as easily as I do, so she wasn't uh, really keen on it. But I think people are such that we find a connection to people. That's, we've changed our name Sunday School to Connection Groups. And in our staff meeting on Monday, we talked a lot about connections. And even in the new app, I hope you will download it. You will love it, I promise you. But even in it, we talk about how to connect because that's the most important thing in church is being able to connect with other people as well as to connect with God. It's a whole circle there. And so I, I feel like that's the way it is with people, that we all find a kind of connection with people of which we can, uh, we can laugh with them, we can cry, we can share in the commonality of human experience, uh, just meeting people. When we look into God's Word, that's what excites me. We read the people stories that are uh, contained there. It, it goes all the way back. And every story, it looks like God just lays out a people story. And you get to read this, this great story about whatever has happened during and, uh, those times. And they are, to me, fascinating. I love to read stories. Abraham, uh, one of my favorite, of course, is Daniel. I love to read all of those stories because they're irresistible. They grip your heart. They prick your conscience. They challenge your faith. And they call us hopefully to a higher level of devotion and service to God. And that's what all of this is about. They uh, link us to God's eternal will and, and, and plan for our daily lives. So God makes sure that these stories stay preserved and they, they listen as we read His Word. They are recounted by every generation and over and over again. Uh, the one thing that we, we're missing today is that you remember how that you went to Sunday school and you learned these stories and you, and you grew up learning these stories. How important that was. If you don't believe it, watch Jeopardy every now and then. And they throw a Bible category up there and those people look like deer caught in the headlights. They're like, because they don't know anything. They are illiterate when it comes to Scripture. They don't know the stories, even the simplest stories. They don't know it. Why? Because they've never been raised. Uh, even way back, like, like Abraham and others, they would sit around a campfire at, night, at nighttime playing there in Nintendo. <laughs> they would sit around the campfires at night and they would tell these stories. I can almost hear as Abraham tells how his, his, his joint was that. Jacob tells how his joint, uh, hip was out of joint. I, I can see all of that because they were interesting. And God used them preserve, to preserve that word all down to through the successive generations. God has always had a people. And... and I believe that he's always had someone willing to step out and lead, direct, or maybe even just follow, but someone to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. And I believe that 2020 is no different than that. God's still got a people. You are it. Paul his sermon in Antioch is one of those stories. In fact, he takes it and he relates a story of a nation that had been emancipated from bondage, only then to move out into the desert and languish for 40 years in the wilderness. 
He tells how God chose prophets to lead that nation of new immigrants. He tells us how a king was, was crowned to lead God's people. He tells us how a shepherd boy of sterling character was anointed to rule over Israel. And then came Jesus, rejected and finally executed. But he tells this story for a reason. And here's the reasons. We are a people of destiny. I love that word. Maybe it's overused, I don't know. But I like to think my life has purpose. I like to think my life has meaning. I like to think that I am where I am because God had chosen that place for me and directed my life that I might be there. There was one that was said, for such a time as this. I think that reigns true in all of our lives today, that God has a people of destiny. There's one thing that always brings me back, and that is that God is faithful, always faithful to prepare for himself a people. Look at verses 16 through 20. Then Paul stood up <clears throat> and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelled as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm he brought them out. Now for a time of about 40 years he put up with their... I love that. He put up with. Sounds like a mom and a daddy, doesn't it? Put up. He put up with their ways in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Cana, he distributed their land to them by the allotment. And after that, he gave them judges for about 400 years, 450 years, until Samuel the prophet came. So what is he saying? He is saying in those few short verses, I've always had a people. I've always had a, a group. And I don't think that 2020 is any different. Whether we're in captivity or wanderings about in the desert or in conquest of the promised land or living through whatever it is we're going through now, God will always have a people. Ones who he can count on, who preserves and nurtures his special love and people of destiny. You can hear it in their own story. Paul lets them tell it by their own experience. Special protection. They're in Egypt. And all of the plagues and all of the things that's going on, God protects them. They're in a land of Goshen. They're in a special place from a special God who gives them special care. When they are liberated from that land and they move across the desert, we see how God takes care of them. How does He do that? He sends in food. He sends water out of a rock. Their clothes never wear out. Their sandals never wear through. What does that mean? It means I've taken care of them. Forty years in a desert, I've taken care of them. Listen, he brings them into a promised land. After 40 years of wandering around, he fulfills that promise and brings that new front group into the promised land. And he destroys several nations in order to give them that promised land. All of that tells me that we're people of destiny. It tells me that God has his hand on us. That there's a purpose for our life. There's meaning for our life. We're not just here inhabiting some land, just going through the process waiting to die. I have meaning. I have value. I have something about my life that says you have a destiny. I like for somebody to tell me that. I like for somebody to instill in our young people, in our music, in our worship, instill in me. You're a people of destiny. You have meaning. You have life. You have something worth going for. 
getting up going to a job doesn't always equate to destiny. In fact, it gets difficult sometimes. But getting up and fulfilling the destiny that God has for you is the greatest thing that you could do. But Pastor, I'm not sure what destiny I have. You have to get a hold of God. You have to let Him tell you, but they're, they're there. Listen to this. These are people of destiny. You can hear it in their stories. And we learn some very profound lessons that are appropriate for us today that nothing, watch this now, nothing is common or ordinary about any of us. There's no way that people should tell you you're not important, you're not worthy of any. I love that song because it was perfect. We are somebody, we are worthy, and God puts it on us, and he says, you're people of destiny, I have a plan for you. Pastor, how do you know he has a plan? Because he told Jeremiah, I know the plans I have for you. So he had already knew that, he already had planned that, he had already put it out there. And I'm telling you that God has a plan for your life. You may sit here this morning. You may think I'm insignificant. Nobody cares about me. I'm not important. But that's a lie. The devil comes but for to kill, steal, and destroy. You are important. You have a destiny. You are, to God, one of those people of destiny. You may say, well, I'm not a Paul, and I'm not a, a Moses, and I'm not a Joshua. That's all right. You are who you are. And God has that wonderful destiny for you to live out. I'm David Runner. I didn't know what destiny I had. But I can tell you, I'm so glad that God chose my direction. I'm glad of every footstep that I've made. Has it been easy? Not necessarily. But it's been great because I know it's a destiny from God. We are people of destiny. And we are entitled to all the special, this is what this story says, to all the provisions and care consistently given to those people. What is, what is Paul saying here? He's saying, hey, they were in a land of bondage. They were captured, but I had a destiny. They were in a wilderness wandering around, but I had a destiny. I brought them into the land of promise, and there they accumulated land and grew and done good. Why? They were people of destiny. This church is a church of destiny. Because you are a people of destiny. You have something to offer. You have something God has planned out for you. You just need to find it. I think, sadly, there are so many people who have ignored this special destiny and their lives are filled with self depreciation and despair they simply they simply miss the story they've turned a deaf ear they've disregarded the privileged position that God has assigned them to they've ignored the high status decreed for them and are destitute in spirit and attitude because of by their own choices a tragic waste of God's benefits and grace Every Sunday, every church in America, look into the faces of people who are missing their destiny. They're missing their opportunity to be what God wants them to be. You say, well, I don't think I'll ever be great. God never asked us to be great. He asked us to fulfill the destiny that He's placed in our life. It may be teaching a three-year-old in a Sunday school class. It may sweep the floor. It may be running these cameras. It may be a lot of things. But there's a destiny that God has for you. I watched as our music pastor has transformed this platform with musicians. Just brought out talent that I never knew we had. Lisa blew me away. I never knew she could play the piano. 
I've been here nine and a half years. She's been here. I've never heard her sit down at the piano. So that was a first for me. But we are a people of destiny. We're a people that God says, you're important to me. I think this whole story, this whole 13th chapter, is basically to remind us in 2020 that we also are a people of destiny. That we're important. And God wants us to find and fulfill whatever that destiny is. Oh, but pastor, I've messed my life up. Oh, I went through all of that. Don't worry about that. God's good at fixing. In the South, we say we fixing. Well, he's fixing to fix us. The second thing I noticed was not only are we people of destiny, but we're people of influence. You say, Pastor, what does that mean? Well, I believe that God has always, and this chapter teaches us that, that God is always faithful to provide leadership for his people. Oh, but Pastor, I'm not a leader. Wait a minute. I want you to take a look. We're looking at verse 20. And after that, he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward, they asked for a king, so God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as a king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all of my will. There he is. He will do the destiny that I've put for him. And from this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus, after that John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, who do you think I am, he said, I am not he, but behold, there comes one after me whose sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to lose. Now, it, isn't that interesting? Does that not grab you? Let me, let me tell you what that says. Look, look at the persons listed in here of influence that we just read about. It's an interesting mix here. He mentions Saul. He mentions David. He mentions John the Baptist, and he mentions Pilate. Now, if you've had, ever had an interesting mix, that's an interesting mix. They look like they have nothing in relation to each other, but each one influence. Now, the, the problem with influence is you can influence good or you can influence bad. There you go. So, so God is saying, I've always had people of influence. Some people influence right and some wrong. Now, he mentions Saul. Saul was an impressive physical and physical stature, but he was weak in character. He was like a head taller, it said, than all the other, other men of Israel. He came from the tribe of Benjamin, which had huge people. So, so Saul was a great big guy. He was a monster to look at, and, and yet we see that he was very weak in character. But then he talks about David. David was insignificant in, in physique. He, on the contrast of Paul, of Saul and, and David, it was like, you know, Andre the Giant and, and uh, me. <laughs> and so we realize that David was, was not necessarily... Very good in, in physique. In fact, Scripture tells us he was, he was ruddy, fair-complected, kind of small frame. But he was powerful in spirit. So you got the contrast of Saul and David. One big and tall and strong but weak in character. One small in, in, in physique but, but powerful in spirit. And then he mentions John the Baptist. Now, I've never, I would have liked to have met John the Baptist. He's got, I mean, any dude what's out in the wilderness wearing a, lo wearing a skin and eating wild locusts and honey, that's a bad boy right there. He was very, what I would call self-effacing. That, that is, he was, he was humble. But what makes it interesting 
that while he was humble in his temperament, he was powerful or courageous in the presence of threats. Kings could go after him. Religious leaders could go after him. And he was like, whatever. Pilate. We all know Pilate. I wash my hands of it. Pilate was appointed as an authority, but he lacked the inner conviction to speak the truth. Even when he knew that Jesus was not at, like they said, even when he knew he was right, he allowed him to convince him to condemn him to death. So what do you learn in those characters? What do you learn about influence? It's simply this. Authentic influence is measured by obedience to God. You can appoint somebody, that doesn't mean they're influential. You can bring somebody up, doesn't mean anything. Look who he said. I appointed Saul. I knew it wasn't right, but that's what y'all wanted, so you got him. Then I brought David. David's after my own heart. And then John the Baptist, who understood his position, and then Pilate, who simply was there, appointed as an authority, but had no leadership, no influence. So as you recite the story of God's people, I think that you see it again and again and again, that those who walk with God were powerful in their influence. Can I tell you this morning that that's what God's calling us to be? He's calling us to be, to be people of influence. He's saying to us, whatever job you work, wherever you go in this life, whatever you do, you can be a powerful influence if you follow God because that authority, that authentic influence comes from being uh, obedient to God and that's what makes a difference here. I'm persuaded that God has destined each one of us to be person, persons of profound influence. He wants us to realize we're what He wants us to be. For example, more people are watching us than we could ever imagine. In part, we hold their eternal destiny in our hands and help set the direction for people's lives for good or for evil by the way we influence them. It's imperative that we show godly influence. It's, it's just so important for us to do what God's called us to do. Let me remind you this morning that none of us walk life alone. There are a lot of people, a lot of uh, uh, followers who join us on the journey. Teresa's uncle was an old holiness preacher. He's been dead now for many years. He told me one day, right after I got saved, I, I'm not sure he really believed I was ever saved, but, but he said to me, you're the only Bible, and he's heard that, I'm sure, that some people ever read. And the truth of the matter is, the influence that you give may be the only influence that a person has. It's imperative. It's important for the job we work or the family we live in or the people we get around. It's important for us to be a powerful influence. How do I do that, Pastor? By walking in obedience to God. The more I walk in obedience to God, the more powerful influence I become. So thirdly, in this story, he tells us that we are people of insight. That's and important. I believe we are set here to proclaim His eternal purposes. I'm not here to set my agenda. I'm not here to, to be some flamboyant something. I'm not here except to do the will of God. It is to become and have insight to what He wants in my life and out of my life. Look at verse 23. From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus. And then it has this word in verse 24. After John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you think I am? I am not he. 
But behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whom, whose feet I am not worthy to lose. Now, did you get that? That's something important there. I've always been impressed with John the Baptist. He's the kind of guy I would have liked to have hung around with. I mean, you see him in the desert eating locusts and wild honey and then preaching fire down from heaven. You see him talking to leaders, and yet he holds a powerful influence in their lives. So much so that when his death came, it came uh, because some lady didn't like the fact he had told her the truth and said, how about cut his head off? Never said it'd be easy doing this kind of work, by the way. He knew, John did, who he was. That's what I like about him. He knew who he was. There was never a question in his mind. There was never something that, that just kind of uh, made him uneasy. He, he knew the dimensions of his task. He knew what he was supposed to do. He knew on whom his devotion should center. There was never a question. John didn't come out and say, I'm the guy, I'm hot shot. He didn't write magazines or sell tapes. He didn't do any of those things because John knew what his purpose was. I think sometimes that that's where we have trouble. We have a tendency not to understand what it is that God's wanting us to do. I've had so many questions over the years as well as Pastor Branson, I'm sure, what is the will of God for my life? Well, the will of God for your life is to work, walk in obedience to His Word and to lift up Jesus. If He be lifted up, He'll draw all men unto Him. So my job is not to be the greatest leader in the whole world as much as my job is to lead people to Christ. And so when you look at John, his life was kind of a combination of a very strict self-denial and, and yet bold exhortation. He, he could move just from, from the tranquility of that desert out there where he was to the irreverent courts of Herod with equal confidence. It didn't matter to him. And, and the reason, there was no split devotion. The reason was that he understood what he was supposed to do. I love that about John the Baptist because it tells me my center has to be on Christ. My focus has to be on lifting Christ. My focus has to be to lift up the things of God and God will take care of all the rest of it. And so John could be a man of solitude one minute and then be ablazed a, a with a kind of an anointed rhetoric that blistered the ears of those pious religious people. And behind John's personality, the sheer force of his personality, was a single-hearted obedience. He, he always pointed to Jesus. From his lips flowed the pointed statement of priority. He must increase, and I must decrease. That was John's philosophy. That was what John's priority was. That, was. that was what made him a man of insight. He knew what he was here for. He knew that his job was not to be Savior. His job was to promote the Savior. We've sort of got it backwards in our day and time. We need this kind of same quality in our church and in our following today. When especially where deception abounds and the very spirit of Antichrist has loosened the world and you've got people out there going, I'm the answer, I'm it, I'm the one. If you, if you elect me or you come work for me or whatever. When it's not about them but God. Truth is being trampled in the streets of America today like never before. They don't even care. People don't even care. They don't care about this country. They don't only care about their agenda. Could you imagine if John the Baptist came along and said, well, I'm supposed to tell you about this Jesus guy, but I want to tell you what a great guy I am. I'm a real, I'm a real prophet here, bud. 
You ought to follow me. I'm a great guy. You don't hear John do that. John said, hey, there's one coming after me whose sandals I can't even unloose. I must decrease and he must increase. And you go, that's it, John. That's the thing. And that's where we are today. We find uh, uh, that we're people of destiny. We understand that we're people of influence to Christ. We're people of insight that says, this is Christ. Follow him. And So, John is that way. This... 2020 is the hour for the people of God to rise up and confront the works of darkness. For to rise up and confront spiritual perception. Because spiritual perception is the crying hour need for the hour. Finally, in this, we the people. Paul tells us about the people of decision. I think that this fourth and final thing to remember is that God is faithful to prepare for himself a Savior to redeem his people. Verses 26 through 41 really talks about that. Because everything that started way back in Egypt was climaxed at Calvary. That Jesus came and that he gave his life a ransom for many and they killed him. I love verse 29. It says, Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, that's where we're going, they took him down from the tree, laid him in a tomb. Next verse. But God. Woo-hoo. I like that but God going on, hey? They think, we got him. We killed him. Put him in the tomb. Lock the door. Seal it up. But God. So when you come along and you're going for God and things seem like they're out of control, but God. When it seems like you're not going to make it and you don't understand where your help is coming from, but God. Can I tell you, we need a little bit of that going on today. When we're just out of it and say, Lord, I'm trying to be an influence and these people are crazy. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be some kind of a, a person of help here and these people are nuts. But God can move on the scene. Paul seems to conclude this very powerful sermon with both a summary of what's taken place and a call. In other words, he's saying, this is what's happened. Now you have to make a decision. And and so he, he talks of all the events that led up to Christ's death. And then he calls for each of the listener to embrace this new thing that God had planned for his people. And the invitation called for a decision. He simply, what will you do with Jesus? Well... In in the same way, we have a conclusion today. I've told you that that we're all of these different people, that we're a a people of destiny. I believe that that God has His hands on you. You you may sit here and think, well, I'm, I'm not really anything or anybody, but God's got His hand on you. God wants you in His business. He needs you in His business. And coming out of that, He makes you a, a person of influence. You're going to influence family members and friends and job workers and all kind of people. Your life influences them. Your obedience to Christ. And then he, he wants you to have an a influence of insight. Be aware that we're living in the last days. Be aware that Jesus could come any moment, that we're living in these times where we're not certain if tomorrow won't bring a trumpet sound and a great going home. Woo! Amen? God says you've got to make a decision. The worst thing that could happen is for you to get up from this seat, walk out that door, and not make a decision. 
not only just for serving Christ or giving your life to Christ, but for serving Christ. We had a great uh, Sunday. Last Sunday it was, wasn't it? Serve. We served day. It was great. We had a wonderful lunch, and then people mingled through the different booths to find out where they might could serve. But it's not all about just finding a job, but more or less finding a job where you can glorify Christ, that you can, that you can work for Christ, because that's what we're all doing. So John says, I'm not he. I'm just the one coming before him. So God needs us to do a little coming before him. And so he wants you to make a decision. The saddest thing is for you to walk out those doors and say, ah, let the young people do it. I've done this for 40 years. Let somebody else do it. I told them in the early service, I've been doing it. I'll be 67 years old next month. Hey, I'm old. He's 100. Well, I say he's 140, but he's about 180 now. We started walking the door. I said, let's go show them how two old fat guys can do it. We're both losing weight, by the way. Hoping somebody else will find it. So what do we do with Jesus? So you follow this pro progression of from Egypt's captivity through the desert wanderings, continued during the times of kings, and finally reaches its pinnacle at Calvary. And Paul is saying that's where it started, and that has brought us to this place. Now let's make a decision. Because they were building a church. They were trying to go forward. So he says, this is where we start. What do you do with Jesus? My question to you today would be, what are you going to do with this sermon? Are you a person of influence? Are you a person of insight? You know, I, I talked in the early service, and I failed to mention it in this one, but, but sometimes when you're... God's answer, man, doesn't make it any easier. It, uh, Pastor Branson was reading a book, and he told me about it later. Uh, the great prophetic voice of our century, David Wilkerson. I did not know until he read it in his book and told me. He said, he said David Wilkerson admits, now here's this greatest prophet of ever for our time, said he went through his whole life wondering if Jesus loved him. The devil wants to stop you. He doesn't want you to be a people of destiny. He doesn't want you to fulfill that place in your life. He wants you to get up and go to a job and a mundane existence of going about and doing nothing. He doesn't want you to find that special place of destiny where you become what God wants you to be. Whether it's teaching a three-year-old or leading some great ministry. And so Jesus, Paul said, what are you going to do with him? What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with the message? What will you do with the thought of what I'm supposed to be? I may be unsure of a lot of things, but being a pastor was not one of them. There was one time in my life that I was preaching a lot of revivals. Good Lord, I don't know, 20, 30 revivals and pastoring a church and, uh, and leading singing and wearing my voice out. And uh, I left the church. I, I really think I was supposed to leave it, but I thought I was going to go on the evangelistic field. Back then they had revivals. Y'all remember revivals? So I took off, and I was doing all kind of revivals and going along, and then it dawned on me, I'm not an evangelist. I used to preach hard, and, you know, I was one of them, ha, glory to God, get your Bible, hallelujah. But after wearing my throat out, I decided that wasn't it. So I, I, was, I would go from church to church. I felt empty inside, and God reminded me, I didn't call you to be an evangelist. 
I call you to be a pastor. So I found myself back in the pastor because that's where I feel fulfilled at. That's where I feel like my job to lift Christ is. That is, whatever destiny I have, that is it. So the question comes now, what is your destiny? What does God want to do in your life? And are you willing to let him do that? Bow your heads with me. Lord Jesus, I don't know what the destiny is for all of these people, but I can tell you, you know the plans. You've already drawn them out. you got them out there. You're just waiting on them to commit to that. You're waiting on them to go, yes, Lord, that's what I'm going to do. I believe that's what you want me to do, and I'm going after it. I don't care what simple, how simple the task may be or how great it might be. Just finding that place. So, Lord, I pray this morning in this service, not that we have a deluge of people saying, oh, I want to be this and I want to be that, but that we have a group of people who will get on their knees and say, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? How can I fulfill the destiny? Because once they do, Lord, that's the greatest place in ministry to be is in that place of destiny. And so, Lord, I ask that you uh, touch their hearts, that you reach down and, like John the Baptist, show them what they're to be how to become that and that when we leave this place today there will be a sense of that destiny in our hearts and in our lives and for that I ask you Lord do that do that in them today and I know I know I know that their lives will become more fulfilled than ever before you said Jesus that you come to give us life I believe that that's the part of life that you're trying to give us. Our sense of destiny, our sense of influence, our our, our sense of, of understanding and insight. Lord, help us. I pray it in Jesus' name. While your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, let me ask you this question. How many of you sit here today and you go, I really, really, really want to do what God wants me to do? But I'm, I'm kind of confused, Pastor. Not, don't really know, but I'd like to find it out. I'm not sure if I'm where I'm at in life. I need to find my place. Would you pray for me? You just slip that hand up and right back down, and I can pray for you and you and you and uh, scores of others who lifted their hands. Find your destiny. God has a place of destiny for you. Don't let the devil steal it, rob it, take it away from you. Find, you. boy, we got some great leaders, Pastor Bruce and others who are helping people to find their connection in their, in their spiritual lives and destiny. So we need that today. We need for you to respond to that. Stand with me together. Appreciate you being here this morning. Let me remind you, Wednesday night, uh, we're one of the churches that's full steam ahead. We uh, have something for everybody Wednesday night. We have a service in here. 
We have several classes. We have youth. We have children's ministries all at 7 o'clock and encourage and invite you to come be back with us. And, uh, you know, at this point, we don't know how long we can do this. If this COVID thing continues to persist, they may make some alterations to things again. So let me encourage you to be as faithful as you possibly can. I used to always tell my churches, I pastored about 44 years, you vote with your feet. If you don't come, you're telling me you don't care whether we have this stuff or not. So be here. Be a part of what God's doing here. Father, we ask now that you'll go with us.